Good afternoon, everybody. I trust you can hear me well enough. Um, I'm talking to you from the town of Palabora in Lampopo on the border of the Kruger National Park. Um, and it's my pleasure to share with you today some insights into the life of one of the more fascinating birds that you would find uh, in this sort of environment, um, that is the southern ground hornbill. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, there are some instructions. Uh, please observe those. Um, more than welcome to type in your questions, which we can address once the presentation is done. So the title of the presentation today um, comes from the uh, the work and, and, and sort of some of the thinking that, that went into driving literally hundreds of, hour, uh, of kilometers and um, probably also uh, similar numbers of, of hours through the Kruger north to south uh, during the work that we did over a period of almost 10 years to uh, study the species. Um, and we call it big blushing chickens and the many stairways to heaven. So the big, blush, big, big black blushing chickens side of things is fairly easy to understand if you look at the bird. Uh, it's uh, quite large size. Uh, the red face is where the blushing comes from. Uh, and it's a sort of a name that we came up with while we were driving. Uh, you know, inevitably, the conversation turns to more mundane things. And we, um, at some stage, came up with his name and it stuck. And uh, that's what we called it um, sort of uh, in, informally. Uh, while we were busy with the work on, on this uh, really very interesting species uh, in the Kruger. So just in terms of introduction, uh, more formal information around the species itself. It is currently listed uh, as nationally endangered uh, in this country. And from a global perspective, it is listed as vulnerable. Um, the estimated national population of the species currently stands at uh, 10,000, uh, 1,000 birds roughly with the vast majority of the birds that do occur within the Greater Kruger National Park area, the APNR, the Limpopo Valley, but they also are uh, smaller populations in the Midlands uh, and towards the south coast of Pizulu Natal. Uh, the work that we conducted here was, was uh, within the framework of that of the Southern Ground Hormel National Action Group that was established in 2003-4 following a PHVA process uh, that sort of provided initial guidelines in terms of the uh, conservation efforts focused on the species. And that was then replaced by a more, uh, more up-to-date plan in 2012. And that plan again was updated uh, about 2018-19 again. Uh, so the National Ac Species Action Plan really guides all conservation work focused on the species within our country, but also now to a larger extent beyond our borders into Southern Africa, uh, into other parts of the range of the species also. The aims of our project in the Kruger National Park primarily were to study the species in situ, in other words, in the wild, rather than, you know, from an EWT perspective to, to focus on birds in captivity, captive breeding and so on. There were other partners and they still are partners that are focusing on that. Uh, we don't see that as our forte. Our work was mainly with the wild populations. And in, in terms of South Africa, obviously the focus then is within the Kruger Park. Um, and we uh, undertook to monitor all known nesting sites uh, throughout the breeding season and the breeding season for these birds we'll talk about shortly to analyze the, the results, to uh, get an idea of how successful these birds are in this uh, core area of occurrence in the country, um, and then also to look at certain aspects that can assist us and that can provide guidance in terms of some of the conservation actions that we were busy with uh, together with other partners at the time. Uh, and then also to make recommendations, uh, you know, to have better informed conservation decisions to benefit the species. So our project within the Kruger in particular uh, sort of in, was initiated in, in roughly 2003 and ran until the end of 2016. Um, and who knows, we might uh, reinitiate some work uh, in future if there is a need, but I think uh, the work that has been done has already answered a, a, a substantial number of questions that uh, needed addressing uh, so that we could make proper conservation decisions for the species. So just to get back to the birds themselves, and, and, and that's really what the focus primarily should be on today. Um, in South Africa and in Southern Africa in particular, 
the breeding season for the species is very much determined by the commencement of the wet season uh, in our part of the world. Uh, generally starts uh, either September and it runs through until about April every year. And the onset, as I said, is determined by when the first uh, proper rains start falling and uh, the female then will lay two eggs. Uh, you can see on the, on the, on the right-hand side there an example of one of the nests. Very typical um, is that she lays two eggs. In, in, in some instances, only a single egg is laid. Uh, and the, one, the first egg will generally hatch uh, quite a few days prior to the second one hatching. Um, and what that results in is uh, that second chick very often not surviving for very long. But should anything be wrong with the first uh, first hatched individual, uh, they, they could be, you know, maybe maybe a disease or some disability and so on. Then the second chick will very likely be the stronger, will outcompete uh, the other. And ultimately, the uh, second chick or the weaker chick with, within the pair will perish as a result. Um, the parents tend to feed and the group tends to feed the youngster that, that competes most successfully for food. The nesting period is about 80 days. Uh, that's how long those youngsters stay in the nest. Um, and we then, in, in terms of our work, generally when we did ringing, and I'll talk about that a bit later, fitted these birds with, with colorings at about 60 to 70 days, about 10 days before they would leave the nest, join the group and start foraging uh, with them um, without being attached to the nest too much. The procedures that we followed, we, we generally went to nests uh, about five times a year during the cycle, initially to just to see whether the birds were attending to the nest, uh, whether they were lining, whether they were planning to breed. Um, and then all of the nests were, that showed signs of activity were, were checked again in November uh, to see what the situ situation was, how many eggs uh, the nests contained, to look at the viability of the eggs. In other words, whether they were uh, indeed uh, fertilized and, and whether they, they would, uh, the chick would develop and, and would likely hatch. And then in December, we would re revisit these, these nests to see uh, what the progress was. Generally with the onset of the breeding season in the Kruger, these ch chicks would hatch uh, late November through to early January. And that is also then when uh, with the quota and the permit that we had at our disposal, we were able to harvest some of these second chicks uh, to and, and move them and, and make them part of the captive breeding population. They were handed over to one of the partners that were responsible for hand rearing these chicks, um, which I'm not going to focus on too much. I think uh, with the, the time at our disposal, we can focus on, on, on the work that we did with the wild populations. And then towards January and March, we would visit these nests, nests again when the chicks are well developed, when they were close to leaving the nest. And then we would uh, collect data uh, collect genetic material and then fit these individuals with coloring so that we were able to identify them later on. And I'll talk about that a bit, uh, a bit more later. Our nest searches, just to give you an indication, this is the central parts of the Kruger National Park. Uh, all in all, we monitored, uh, we knew of uh, about 170 odd groups of southern ground hornbills across the Kruger National Park, uh, but we were only able to really access about 70 odd of those nests. Um, and we monitored roughly per season uh, between 40 to uh, sort of in the low 50s. Uh, and just to give you an idea of, of some of the densities here of, of the central Kruger Park, we, we did our work all the way from the north. Um, our, our furthest north nest was near Crook's Corner um, on the Levuva River. And then the furthest south was fairly close to the Crocodile River in the south, also areas like Bergendal. So we, we basically covered the whole of the park north to south. Um, and identify as many of these groups as we possibly could um, and to start looking and, and, and seeing what they're doing. And you can see here on this map, we sort of had started getting a fairly good idea in some parts of, of what the neighborhood looked like and, and who, which gang operated in, in which area, so to say. Um, and, you know, once you start getting to this, this stage of the research that you do, uh, you really are already in awe and fascinated by these birds and what they do and how they interact with each other within the group, but also with other groups and, and sometimes with other wildlife. Uh, just in terms of the second chick har harvesting, as I said earlier, the second chick generally perishes. You can see there on that photograph when that second chick is just hatched, how much smaller it is than the first. If the first 
bird is healthy and develops very well. You can see the very, very definite significant difference in size. Uh, and within a few days, uh, the second chick will, will perish. And we also had one instance uh, on, on one of our video uh, recordings of activities in one of the nests that uh, we were actually able to capture a female consuming the, the, the weakest and, and the smallest chick um, probably shortly after it had succumbed sort of removing that protein from the nest, using it as a source of food, uh, but also reducing the risk of potential infection, et cetera, when decomposition, et cetera, would set in with, set in with that second chick. Um, we then looked uh, at the harvesting that was done. We monitored these nests, uh, and it was important for us to determine whether when we take this very short-term insurance policy away uh, for the species, what the impact would be. Um, and all of our monitoring uh, contribute to, to uh, determining what the situation was. But just to share with you some, some of the experiences and the images during this nest monitoring, um, and that's really where you, you get the opportunity to look into and almost uh, you know, get a glimpse into the living room and the living quarters of these groups of birds. And you can see uh, in, in certain instances, yes, they are cavity nesters. Uh, they nest in these um, hollows in, in large trees, um, and sometimes these nests can last for, for quite a long time. At other times, like you see the, the nest on the left there, uh, that old leadwood is starting to decay, and unfortunately now it's about 10 years later that nest is no longer in use, uh, while the jackalberry nest on the right is, is, is still functional as far as I know. Um, and then one of the longest running nests that we've had is on the banks of the, of the Letaba River, um, in, in northern Kruger in a big baobab where that nest has now been uh, used successfully. Uh, last year was its, was its 45th year that the group or a group of birds had been breeding there. So some of these nests are really very sturdy and can be used repeatedly uh, and others are used for a short period of time and then abandoned when it's no longer considered suitable by these birds. Uh, these are both females incubating. They are solely responsible for this specific task, is to incubate the eggs. And shortly after that chick uh, or the, the chicks have hatched, she will then leave the nest, join the, join the group, and they will start finding food uh, and bring that back to the nest. One of the nests uh, in the south of the Kruger with two eggs, uh, both in, in good condition, both fertilized. Uh, so this is the early stage where you confirm that the eggs are there. And then you determine also by doing candling uh, roughly when these eggs will hatch and uh, you then time your second uh, visit to the nest according to this so that you are there potentially uh, so that when that second uh, egg hatches, if you do need to, to harvest, you can then uh, do so. Uh, and generally we, we had permission to, to remove the second egg if we were able to determine that the first chick is healthy um, that there was uh, that it was feeding and, and, and there was no uh, serious issues in terms of development, etc. We were then able to, as soon as the second egg was pipping, in other words, when the when the second chick was breaking through the eggshell, we were allowed to remove a small number per year. I'm talking, you know, of all of the nests that we monitor, roughly between 40 to, to 50, 54 nests uh, per year. Uh, I'm talking about a, a small quota of about six birds, roughly per year, that we were. Uh, permitted to remove and uh, hand over for uh, captive uh, and hand rearing. These youngsters develop incredibly fast. Uh, over time, this chick is uh, just about 20 days old, and you can see it's already uh, changed color in terms of skin. Uh, the very, very early stages of feather development is there. Uh, it's still at this stage, though, is uh, blind and cannot see, so, so fairly helpless. Uh, and of course, also a fairly choice uh, piece of protein for, for any potential predator. But uh, generally, the group of ground hornbills uh, do uh, fairly aggressively defend the, the nest area uh, from potential predators at times. I think uh, one exception, of course, is humans, where they tend to uh, fly away and, and basically wait for you to do what you do and then and then they come back very quickly to inspect uh, and uh, they carry on with with provisioning. Uh, this chick is about 40 odd days old. You can see the beautiful blue eyes there, uh, the feather, feather development uh, pretty advanced and this chick is about 
20, 30 days away from, from being fairly close to, to, uh, to leave the nest. Um, in terms of the second check harvesting, what we did confirm, uh, and as that table indicates, is that the harvesting really had no significant impact on, on nest, uh, nestling survival. Once that uh, second check is removed uh, and you've determined that the first is healthy uh, or vice versa, uh, and you remove the, the smaller of the two, the other tends to develop uh, pretty successfully. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the group, depending on environmental conditions, how much food is available, uh, are pretty well equipped to uh, provide food and uh, to ensure that this chick ultimately leaves the nest and fledges and joins up with them um, on, the, on their foraging uh, forays. In terms of, of ringing, uh, over the years uh, in, in uh, since 2008 and 9 is when we first started fitting initially just metal rings to uh, the nestlings. Uh, and then later on, we also added color rings as we needed to identify individuals. Uh, so from about 2010, we color ringed uh, individuals. And uh, over that period, uh, we, of the 85 birds, 58 have been recited uh, to date. Uh, and a lot of that depended on feedback from members of the public, uh, tourists that visit the Kruger. Um, the Kruger is, is really wonderful from that perspective under uh, uh, normal situations. I'm not talking about the current lockdown situation, but generally there are uh, considerable numbers of people that are driving around. They do see these birds and they then reported sightings of the ring birds to us. We had uh, more than three and a half thousand re-sightings records on the database with about a 68% re-sightings rate of those ringed individuals. Just some examples. This is the poster that we used and uh, put up at rest camps and, and various areas uh, throughout the Kruger National Park. And this worked uh, extremely successfully uh, and, and uh, encouraged people to report these birds, uh, sightings of these birds to us. Um, and it certainly was, was uh, a very successful component of the project a, as a whole. Uh, in terms of, of what the ring birds did show us, uh, initially some of the movements of these birds when they do leave the natal area, how far do they move, where do they go to, how long do they stay with uh, their, their natal groups, especially in terms of the males, and then also the evicted females. And how the system works is that there's a single female in a group, she's dominant, and as long as she stays healthy and, and, and viable, uh, the young females, when they reach a certain age, are evicted from the group and they start wandering uh, in search of an area and in search of males that, that uh, can join up with her and they then establish their own groups. Uh, and we wanted to know uh, roughly where they went to, how far they moved and so, so on. Uh, and obviously also by looking at the ring birds and the reports that we receive to get an idea of what the group territory sizes were. Um, and in terms of the ringing, what the longer term survival of these birds were in the Kruger National Park. Just some examples. Uh, this is a group of birds. Uh, this is uh, a group from near uh, the Lataba River uh, in central Kruger. And you can see within this group, uh, three individuals that have been coloring. The bird with a single metal ring is the older of the lot. The bird with the blue and red is a year younger and then the much younger bird there in, in the background is about two years younger than, than, than the two individuals in, in front. And that enabled us to sort of look at, at the age profile um, and to learn a lot about the dynamics within this group uh, in terms, as I said earlier, in terms of females departing and, and so on and so forth. Really very valuable information that, that has not really been looked at in depth uh, pre prior to the work that we did here. Just uh, one example of, uh, of a reciting that is actually fairly recent. Um, I'm currently working in the Kruger, uh, busy with, with other work here. And uh, in the first uh, two weeks or so uh, of our work here in late May, we cited this now adult female um, with a male uh, on the Orpentard Road uh, between Satara and Orpen in the Kruger. And uh, when we looked at our records, uh, it seems to us that this female uh, was ringed in the Bergkandal area in the nest in 2012. And she has now joined with this male, um, eight, and, and, and she's survived 
for eight years and four months when we saw her. And she's moved a total of 114 kilometers north of where she hatched from the nest and where she eventually left the group to where she is now uh, and where she's uh, met up and uh, seemed to have bonded with this individual male. We didn't see any other birds in the group, but it looks as if uh, they are pretty settled and uh, very likely do have a nest somewhere in, in the vicinity of where we saw her. So, so quite a good outcome and it sort of gives you an, an indication of the longevity and, and the survival of individuals within that sample over time. We also conducted satellite tracking. This was done uh, as part of a PhD study that was conducted by Lee Combrink, who nowadays is based in Oregon and the United States uh, at the university there. Um, she became part of our uh, monitoring and research group in uh, roughly 2010 and participated and became so fascinated with the species that it became the subject of her PhD, which she completed through the University of Brazil in Natal. And part of that was to uh, attempt to fit tracking to individuals to look at a, at a range of aspects, among others, territory size, foraging range, and so on and so forth. Uh, and we had sufficient resources to fit six units to birds in the Kruger National Park. We first assessed the fitting of the harnesses to individuals uh, by fitting these to captive birds at the Johannesburg Zoo. Um, the trial went, you know, was quite successful uh, on the captive birds. And we then fitted uh, a unit to a bird that was initially taken in for rehabilitation, was treated at Moholoholo and then released in its... Uh, area where it, it was collected from in the Kruger Park with a tracking unit and uh, it showed that the tracking uh, did not really have an overt impact on the individual. It was able to move around freely to forage and eventually it linked up with a group and uh, carried on with, with its life uh, and we were able to follow its movements fairly closely. Uh, so ultimately we, we trapped uh, three uh, birds in the north of the Kruger and three birds in the south and uh, this is Lee and her husband, Henry, uh, releasing an individual. Uh, this bird was trapped um, in the Cleveland Nature Reserve, bordering onto the Kruger. Uh, but this group we knew spent most of the time inside of the Kruger, uh, just to the southwest of Palabora. And uh, this is them now, after this bird has been fitted with a tracking unit, releasing the bird uh, and letting it go. And um, yes, we did receive and, and, and collect very valuable data from this and all of the other individuals. This is just an example of one of these birds that have been tracked. On that map, you see a white star in the middle, and that is the nest location of this particular group that is located uh, in the Jock Concession in, in, in the south of the Kruger, south of Skakuza. And you can see there the movements of the, of the birds um, at different times um, throughout the year. And you can see the uh, sort of get an idea of the extent of the size of the territory of, of this individual that obviously spent most of its time with the, the group and, and, and foraging together. So it just sort of started giving us an insight into the extent of movements that these birds undertake at different times. Um, it also showed us over time then what the home ranges were of these individuals and you can see how it varies uh, quite substantially between different areas also in, in terms of north and south different types of habitat um, uh, quite a lot of variability as uh, as far as as that is concerned uh, that just for interest if you would like to know more i'm happy to share with you some of the papers that have been published as far as this is concerned with more of the technical detail but i think uh, it's too much information for a talk of this nature this afternoon of course, we also encountered some uh, unfortunate happenings here. Here, uh, we have a colleague that's just removed a ground hornbill chick from a nest cavity. Um, at times, uh, because these birds breed during the wet season, times of very heavy rainfall, if the nests are, are, are not uh, in a cavity that is well drained, uh, it is possible that some of these nestlings may drown. And this is what happened in this instance, unfortunately. Um, so yes, there are mortalities as far as natural occurrences are concerned. And then also the birds at times also regularly interact with other types of wildlife. And you can see here this black-backed jackal uh, aggressively trying to chase off 
these two ground hornbills. So this photograph was taken by a member of the public and that, that shared it with us, uh, Mariana de Clerc. And uh, she said that it, it looked more that the jackal was desperate to chase the, the hornbills away rather than the other way around, that he was trying to predate on them. And we suspect that there might have been black backed jackal pups in a den somewhere. And these black, uh, these uh, ground hornbills are perfectly capable of killing black back jackal pups and, and, and making use of them as a source of food. So the, jack, the jackal certainly had uh, a justified cause for concern over the welfare of its offspring. The ground hornbills really are incredibly efficient foragers and hunters. They catch uh, and kill a large range of prey, uh, mostly uh, invertebrates, insects, uh, and, and, and others, scorpions, etc. And you can see here this young male with quite a, uh, a range of prey items in its bowl. There's a centipede there, there's a scorpion, there's a, a locust, etc. Uh, and we've seen them take a range of prey species. They seem to have a particular uh, preference and, and, and they seem to uh, hunt chameleons quite extensively and make use of them as a source of food. And then also snakes. Um, and you can see here this uh, fully adult male walking around very pride, uh, you know, proudly with his trophy of a puff adder that was killed and uh, on the way to the nest to go and feed that to the chick. And um, yeah, something that a lot of people are aware of uh, and, and that uh, few people have actually witnessed. What you are seeing here is an adult male that is busy uh, feeding on a leopard tortoise. Um, they first attack the soft parts of, of, of the animal, remove the legs, etc. And uh, then they also have the ability with that very strong bull of theirs to actually crack the shell and to feed on the contents uh, on, on the inside as well. Very, very effective in, in their foraging behavior. Um, when you have the opportunity and you sit and you see how these birds move through an area, uh, we have at times been able to actually move ahead of them and sit and wait and, and, and wait for them to approach. And it's actually incredible to see how many of the small animals simply dash away, fly away, run away, and just try and get out of the way of this group of birds that move through the area and, um, and kill just about anything, animals up to the size of rabbits. Um, that, uh, that they can hunt and kill and then take to the nest to feed to the nesting. We also uh, installed some camera traps at, at various nests. We had 10 of these. Um, unfortunately, with the camera traps, ground hormones are pretty curious animals. And initially, we suffered quite a bit of damage and lost quite a few due to these birds attacking and, and, and breaking lenses, etc., with their powerful bulls. Uh, but we were able to collect some very uh, interesting footage and, and, and imagery at various nests um, in, in the Kruger, in particular at two of the nests. And you can see here the, uh, the feeding frequency uh, that these birds exhibit uh, when the female is incubating, the number of times that they visit uh, a nest during the day, when the chick is there with the female, um, the, you can see the frequency there. And then when the chick is on its own and as it grows and develops, the frequency of feeding seems to decline as the chick gets bigger and bigger and bigger, fewer visits to the nest per day, eventually one visit per day. And that really encourages this youngster to uh, ultimately fledge, leave the nest and join the group uh, foraging uh, on the ground, obviously, and uh, to then learn to be a ground hornbill quite successfully within the first year or 18 months of its life. Uh, again, this is just a, another reflection of how that frequency of feeds decrease towards the, the period when this young bird uh, is ready to leave the nest. So there's a real degree of encouragement uh, by the group in, in sort of coming to the nest more or less frequently. Um, and that really, in the end, encourages this youngster to take the big leap and join them in the big world out there. To, uh, to forage and, and to learn how to do things what uh, that ground hornbills do. Just uh, a bit of an indication of, of the food, uh, a significant proportion of what these birds feed on are insects. Um, and then also uh, to a lesser extent, it's going to depend also on where these birds nest uh, and the type of habitat. It's gonna depend on rainfall, uh, amphibians, arachnids, 
uh, are fairly significant. And then reptiles also uh, constitute a significant part of the diet of these birds. Just some of the images uh, that we managed to obtain through these, these camera traps that were installed at the nest. Uh, you can see this female sitting uh, incubating. You can just see the, the one egg uh, at, a, at a knee there. And you can see the male bringing lots of food and some lining to the nest uh, and sort of sustaining the female while she is spending time in the nest incubating. Uh, this is an artificial nest that was erected in the Cleveland Game Reserve uh, bordering on the Kruger and these birds have successfully been using this drum for over a decade now uh, and you know at times people had concerns because it's a plastic drum and many of you know how warm it gets here uh, and we did put temperature buttons inside that nest and at times we measured temperatures of over 50 degrees centigrade but it did not seem to impede the development uh, of the chick um, in all cases bar one that i know of that, that the chick not fledged successfully so um, we did at times augment nest locations and, and and provided nesting options for these birds and this was one of the more successful artificial nests that uh, that I know of that that has been um, installed and that the birds took to very quickly and used uh, for a, an extended period of time. Uh, of course, these birds are vulnerable to a range of predators, both in the nest and also once they've left the nest. You can see here a Janet um, investigating the the cavity, and this youngster fortunately is fairly well grown. Uh, and did survive and did fledge. The genet thought the better of it to, to try and make a meal of it uh, and uh, left soon after this photograph was taken. Um, and, uh, but there are other predators that obviously also visit these nests. I mean, we also, when, uh, in our nest visits and so on, uh, and this is what this slide is trying to share with you, and this is where the many stairways to heaven come in, is uh, you know, we climb to all of these nests at various heights. Uh, some of the nests you can access with a very short ladder or you can stand on the back of a vehicle if you can drive close enough. And then others are easily 20 odd meters up in a cavity in a, in a very tall tree, some of it over water like that photograph in the, in the bottom right there. Um, and you have a wide range of experiences. And I think I worked out yesterday that with the number of nests that we monitored per year and the and the period of time that we monitored these nests over more than a decade we probably uh, erected ladders and climbed up to nests close to between 1600 and 1800 times in the period when we did this monitoring so hence the name or the second part of the name of the presentation being the many stairways to heaven uh, and that illustrates it and just in conclusion i'd like to share with you a video of one of the nests that that we did visit um, uh, during our monitoring and this was uh, this is a nest in a very large tall uh, fig tree uh, in the Pafuri area fairly close to Crook's Corner um, and uh, just shows the ascent to the nest uh, and what you do find at times when you when you when you look in there um, so have a look at this video and get you get an idea of the heights etc that one needed to scale at times So this is a 15 meter ladder uh, and this ladder is basically uh, expanded to its fullest extent and uh, it's tied there to make sure that it doesn't slip uh, and you then climb up to this nest in this in this fig tree. Now we've over time apart from finding eggs and, and chicks etc in some of these cavities of course a cavity, a uh, fairly sizable cavity in a large tree is also potentially considered to be a home by a whole range of species. And uh, we have at times flushed a range of interesting species, uh, genets, uh, a few snakes, uh, a number of barn owls, etc., that also made use of these nests or usurped the nests from the ground humble. You can see there the egg slightly covered with leaves. The group uh, uh, is already off and foraging. And at that stage, we believe that the female had taken a bit of a break from incubation. She did come back and that uh, egg did hatch. It was interesting that it's a single egg instead of two. Uh, and uh, that breeding attempt uh, at that nest was, was quite successful. 
Uh, and yes, then you need to uh, climb all the way down. And if, uh, if there's a chick in there and you do ringing, you bring the chick down to the ground with you, you work, and then you need to go back up again, um, put it back, make sure that it's safe, and, and then you descend again. So lots of ups and downs in, uh, in the world of, of ground hornbill research uh, in a literal sense, uh, and sometimes also figuratively speaking. So that's an, an insight as far as some of the work that we've done. Of course, um, you know, if we start sharing experiences in, in terms of what we've seen and experienced while we were busy with this work, I can probably talk for another week. Uh, but I think that's all we have time for, unfortunately, today. So uh, thank you for listening. And uh, just to acknowledge, uh, very importantly, the sponsors that made our work possible over the years focused on the species. And those are all of the entities that either provided financial or other support. And of course, thank you very much to South African National Park that made it possible for us to study this very uh, important and very interesting species within the Kruger National Park for such a long period of time. Thank you and thanks for listening. Um, I'm going to have a look at your questions in the Q&A and then try and answer those as best as I can. See, there are seven questions, and I see some familiar names here. Uh, Chris van Dijk uh, asking me to explain the term candling. You now, candling basically entails, uh, you know, taking the eggs uh, out of the nest, um, and then while you are covering your head, you actually shine a light through the egg and actually look at whether there has been any em embryonic development within the egg. Uh, and you then obviously replace the the egg back in the nest if it is uh, if it is vi whether it's viable or not, and you enable the birds to carry on with with the incubation. So that just gives us an idea when we do visit the nest whether the nest is a possible source of a chick that can be harvested for the captive or the hand rearing uh, group and and. Uh, to identify a nest that we can go back and potentially harvest from. That's how that, that works. I trust that I have answered you satisfactorily, Chris. And thank you that you listened. It's good to you too. Then Eleanor, uh, Eleanor Mary. Um, so you say not a cane enable situation in the nest, but it depends on the amount of food. Yes, uh, very much so. It's It's more the stronger individual out competing the other. Uh, we didn't see uh, we didn't see evidence of them physically uh, attacking each other like eagles, etc., do. Um, but you know, maybe other studies uh, can can prove us wrong over time. But we, as far as I know, we've never seen any evidence of that taking place. So yes, uh, you are correct in in your assumption there. So how successful are we in reintroducing the second chick once it's old enough, uh, and how it is achieved? That's a question, again, that we can talk uh, at length about, but I would advise you to perhaps go and have a look at the website of the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Uh, I mean, our, our component and our contribution to the captive and the hand-rearing side of things was the harvest of, of these wild uh, chicks in the nest. They were then handed over, and Mabula and other partners were responsible for the hand rearing and then for uh, attempted reintroductions. And they are still continuing with this work. I know that there's been a major initiative now in the last year where they built uh, new BOMAs to, to try and accommodate groups uh, and to forge groups uh, from these individuals and then to reintroduce them back into the wild. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, Lucy Kemp and, and her colleagues at Mobula will be able to answer this far more comprehensively than I can do. So um, I would say suggest that you do make contact with them, Jill, uh, and, and, and sort of get more information from, from that source rather than from myself. Uh, Penny, uh, does the group feed the incubating female? Absolutely. She spends almost all of her time in the nest. Uh, she is, does the, the nest does not get sealed like the smaller hornbills do. Uh, she sits in an open cavity, um, and you can see from some of those photos, the size of the cavity can vary, the depth of it can vary. We had one cavity that was almost two meters deep, another that barely concealed the bird when it was incubating. Uh, it is not enclosed, but she gets uh, and receives food fairly frequently throughout the day. 
the entire group is very attentive and provides it with food while incubation takes place and they continue with feeding the the chick and the female when it's still fairly small and it can't thermoregulate, regulate and then eventually she will join the rest of the group in foraging and finding food and providing for the chick um, so yeah that uh, that is sort of how that that works Lizelle Reineke asks whether they mate for life. Uh, do the couple use the same nest each year? Now they're breeding uh, biology. It's basically a group of birds that, that work together to, to, to breed successfully, but there's a dominant male and female, and they do seem to uh, maintain that pair bond very, very closely. Uh, and uh, unless one of these individuals die or, or anything happens, uh, and it can then be replaced. It seems as if these pair bonds can last for quite a long time. Yeah, mating for life is, I, th I think, uh, a fairly vaunted ideal, uh, you know, from a human perspective. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, we we've not really studied them that long, and of course, we we didn't really mark individuals. We try to uh, impact the dominant males and females of a group as little as possible, for instance, so that we. And we were not able to mark them individually. So at this stage, with the study that we've done, I can't really answer your question uh, as far as the mating per se uh, takes place and, and happens for life. Uh, Bronwyn, uh, how do you, you tell if they are male or female? Well, that's fairly easy. Uh, Grand Humbles are quite kind to us in that, in that respect, in that the bird that you see on the screen now, uh, that is, uh, this is an adult female. Uh, you can see the blue uh, below the bull on the throat of this adult female. The male uh, has an entirely red gula pouch uh, under the bull. Uh, and that's how you can fairly easily distinguish between adult males and females in the field. Uh, and even in the sub-adults, the females will start showing some of that blue uh, under the throat. The intensity of that blue tends to become a little bit more intense when the birds uh, are breeding. Uh, but again, that's, uh, that's a fairly easy way for you in the field to separate uh, male and female individuals in a group. Janine Gibbons asks, we frequent Kruger and see families of ground hornbills at just about every visit. Uh, does that mean that they are no longer vulnerable or, or endangered? Uh, certainly not. Uh, Janine, if you think about the population uh, with, within the Kruger and in the greater Kruger, uh, apart from tiny populations in the KZN Midlands and, and down on, on the coast, uh, the south coast of, of KZN and a little bit inland from there, uh, there are no other ground hornbills really or, or viable populations of ground hornbills, uh, maybe a few in the Limpopo Valley as well, but the populations really have shrunk in South Africa quite extensively. So from a national perspective, uh, we believe that the species still warrants endangered status outside of protected areas it's very uh, it's a very rare occurrence that these birds can sustain themselves uh, and they do face a range of threats so uh, yes they are still considered nationally endangered although uh, across the entire range within africa the species is only listed as vulnerable i trust that that answers that question for you mareike sterren van die karoe goed om van jou te hoor mareike asks uh, uh, I can't wait to go and show my family these spectacular birds next year in the Kruger. <laughs> yeah, uh, let us know if you are here, if I'm around. It would be good to meet finally. We've uh, corresponded quite extensively on guru vultures and so on and so forth. So we'd love to meet you at some stage and uh, have a cup of coffee and, and, and talk about, uh, about our joint interests uh, on a range of uh, birds and conservation in general. Uh, then Eleanor Mary uh, asked another question, is it important that harvested and hand reared chicks are introduced in groups rather than singly? Uh, yes, uh, the short answer is indeed. I mean, these birds uh, live in these groups uh, and, and, the, and the group dynamic is quite important in terms of successful reintroduction. Reintroducing singletons uh, in, into a particular area, uh, especially where there are no other ground ombles around, uh, you know, I, I don't really think there's there's a huge chance of, chance of success, and the the reintroduction side and the people responsible for the reintroduction of these birds really approach it from that perspective is to uh, is to look at developing and establishing uh, bonded groups, uh, viable bonded groups, and to 
in that manner, uh, then once they have located or identified a suitable area, is to release a group of individuals uh, and then obviously monitor their progress as um, as they as they progress. But it's a it's a bit of a process and it's a costly exercise um, that is that is fraught with with challenges and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, I trust that with what we've learned and and what other studies have started to show that we are pretty close to working out and, and cracking the formula for successful uh, wider scale reintroductions of the species, not just in our country, but potentially elsewhere also. Uh, I see another couple of questions. Bronwyn again, uh, do both chicks ever survive in the wild if the second chick isn't removed? We are not aware of, 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 that, uh, of that sort of thing happening. It would be extremely rare. Uh, and I would imagine it would have to be a spectacular year in terms of food availability and so on for that to happen. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, incidents like that, but there have been incidents where two chicks of similar age have been seen in a group foraging, you know, uh, let's say months after the individuals are fledged. But what does happen and what we know can happen is that individual ground humble groups might actually try to lure youngsters across to their group. Uh, there have been instances recorded where they kidnap juveniles from other groups and integrate them into their own group uh, and then treat them like their own, rear them like their own. Obviously, uh, the, the motivation there could be to grow their own group and the numbers of their own group faster so that uh, you know there are more individuals within the group that can assist with feeding uh, future youngsters during breeding attempts and so on and so forth. Madeline, uh, are these birds used in Muti like vultures are? It's a bit of a mixed bag in, in terms of ground humbles. There are some cultures that really hold these birds in awe and, and consider them to be totem birds. Uh, a number of cultures believe that these birds, uh, some, some call them the rain birds because they start calling and they start breeding, uh, you know, when, when the rainy season, at the onset of the rainy season. So they, in some uh, cultures, do enjoy uh, special protection. Uh, but then in others and in certain parts of Africa, yes, there are people that believe that the use of, of certain parts of these birds do, uh, you know, do either have medicinal qualities or they, they afford you certain abilities. But um, I... Uh, there are a number of papers that have been published, but I'm certainly not an expert in that field. Happy to perhaps send you some of those uh, if you are interested, um, Madeline. And then looks like the last question is from Iris Hoffman. Uh, what are the enemies of the ground humble? Well, if you want to know what the enemy of the ground humble is, probably the biggest one is you can go and look in a mirror. Uh, humans and, and human activities, human expansion, fragmentation of habitat due to human activities, uh, poisoning. Uh, we have had birds electrocuted on, on power lines and so on and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, out here in, in an area like Kruger, these birds, uh, with the size that they are, they are the target of, of some predators. Uh, we've received, with the study that we did here, photographs of uh, caracal, for instance, uh, actively hunting ground hornbills. Uh, and I would imagine a range of other predators, uh, leopards, uh, pythons, pythons also uh, will predate nests, genets, etc., will predate the youngsters and the eggs in the nests. Even tree squirrels um, potentially can feed on the eggs in the nest, uh, you know, if the female leaves it for a short period of time. So there are a range of natural predators, but I think once these birds have fledged and, and are, you know, are, are sort of part of the group, the number of potential predators do reduce, but you know they're still out there in a natural environment, and um, you know anything from leopards down uh, that are big enough and are strong enough to to subdue an individual will probably try and make a meal of them. I think those are all of the questions uh, at this stage. Um, so I think we have reached the conclusion of our talk. My uh, Contact details are there. Um, as you can see there, my portfolio currently is, is the Vultures for Africa program. Uh, that's really the primary focus of the work that I currently do. So if you have any questions on either the ground humble work and uh, or the work we do on vultures in Africa, then you are more than welcome to contact me. 
by email, uh, preferably. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to see what I can do to answer your questions um, and maybe to try and address some of your concerns. Thank you very much for your time and thanks for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.